It was a hundred years ago that Pinellas County was established. In this series, people will tell its story in their own words and remember how it all began. In the early part of the 19th century, George S. Candy decided that a bridge linking St. Petersburg with Tampa could be built across Tampa Bay. Ellen Gandy O'Brien, the granddaughter of George Candy, remembers him well. When my grandfather moved his home down here, this became his residence, and uh, well, the first thing he did was build the Plaza Theater building, the old Plaza Theater building, and when he built that, it was the largest theater south of Atlanta. He was always full of it. <laughs> and so he built that first. And But then the talk, uh, he got thinking about we ought to have a bridge to get over to Tampa. Because at that time, you had to get in your little tin dizzy or whatever you had and drive all the way around Oldsmar to get to Tampa. So a lot of people would uh, spend the night in Tampa once they'd gotten there, you know, and then take the long drive back and so forth. So they started doing surveys to try to find out where it would be most expedient to build the bridge, where it was uh, shallower, you know, on each end. And they had to build and fill that make causeways to come out to the bridge itself. And uh, so they finally got it all worked out, but then they were interrupted um, because of World War I, and it just wasn't appropriate or possible to do at that time. So then when the World War I was over, they uh, managed to get it started and underway, and they, uh, had uh, just lots of interest and, and people were, it was really fun. There was no road up there. There was no uh, road, I don't know, I went up about, well, there's a section on 4th Street North that um, it was where the road stopped mm -hmm. and it didn't go all the way. So they had to do the, the road and we have, book upon book upon book of pictures of the construction of the bridge. And so they finally did get it built and up in 1924. It was open. And uh, it was uh, quite, quite a workout, I guess, for all of them. But it was a good thing because it was a long time before then. I think the next bridge that came along was uh, Davis Causeway. That was the next one that came across the bridge. But it was a long time in coming, and so that bridge was, uh, and it was a toll bridge. And uh, uh, they had uh, tolling things mm -hmm. out in front of the huge uh, part that was a toll gate. But that's how that, that came into being. And it was Granddad had talked to uh, some friends of his, uh, Walter Fuller being one of them, and uh, they, when they had the opening for the bridge, they played it up and had a good time. Had 16 governors here, <laughs> but it was the longest automobile toll bridge in the world. Well, Mother would take my brother and I up to the Jersey Shore in the summer, and Daddy would stay here. He had sand in his shoes, and he wasn't leaving. He'd go up for two weeks or so, but he wouldn't stay. And he always called this mullet farm, because he'd lie in bed at night and with no air conditioning at that point in time, and he'd hear the mullet jumping in the bio. So he started calling it mullet farm. And when I went back to Philadelphia to school, I'd get letters from the mullet farm. <laughs> so, but he never put the, uh, you know, put it out or anything, said anything about it except within the family. So when my husband and I moved down here, I said, can we please put a little marker saying mullet farm <laughs> in memory for dad? And he said, sure. There were some unique neighbors while living on the big bayou. 
the Shark House was there. I believe the man's name was Shaw. And he had built the Shark House directly across the bio from us. And there was quite a market. I didn't realize that. In fact, for years, I didn't know why they were fishing shark. But um, they had apparently enough orders to keep them busy to sell the shark fin to the uh, oriental uh, restauranteurs up north. And so they sent it up there. And he had drying racks over at the, uh, he had a regular, he had a little office and a little roof over it, you know, and then the rest was an open, but just a top roof, um, shark house. But he uh, did very well, I guess, because he was there for a long, long time. Driftwood was one of the oldest neighborhoods in St. Petersburg. Well, in, uh, I guess it was, they started building there in 37. And there were two gentlemen from Racine, Wisconsin, one of whom, they built big turbines or something up there, or something large equipment <laughs> and uh, so he uh, the two of them came down here one time and they uh, came here to the house there was just a dirt road out here and i don't know who who mentioned daddy to him but they came down to see him and they said that they had bought that property east of us and uh, that they wanted to talk to him about you know, how we felt about having that developed and all this nice business, you know, they were very nice men. And so they told us what they were planning to do. And they wanted to build it. Uh, it's unique in that the houses are all like little doll houses almost, you know, a lot of them are, little staircases are only about this wide. And they are, were very, uh, very attractive. A lot of charm and just beautiful. And they hired um, Mark Dixon Dodd, who was a local artist here who used to do a, a lot of nice work for the city and for people. And he became the, uh, I guess he pretty well designed them and had uh, oversaw the construction of them. And so they built Driftwood Inn. And it was, I guess they opened the first part and then they opened another bit that brought the road over here at right angles to us. And uh, that it has been pretty much owned by families and generation after generation after generation, which is really nice. During Prohibition, the neighborhood actually had a speakeasy called the Hawaiian Gardens. It was right over here. In fact, my daughter' uh, house, the house that they own, is right on the place where Hawaiian Gardens was. Now, this was during the Prohibition to begin with. And uh, so you came down a little dirt road, which is now Florida Avenue. And uh, they had, uh, I never went there because I, I was young when this was going on. And besides which, I don't think my father would have approved. <laughs> Anyway, but uh, um, Bethel's daughters uh, ran the place, and it was called Hawaiian Village, and they had, uh, I guess it was like a little speakeasy or something, you know, and they had booze and so forth. And uh, some people learned to know about it because they were stationed here at the, either the, uh, Oh, uh, yeah. Coast Guard base, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and those people apparently knew mm -hmm. where they were all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and so they uh, would come down that road. And one night, I, uh, we were, my brother and I were young, and there again, we, Daddy got up and walked outside. And I thought, what is he doing, you know? He got a hose. He was soaking down, we had at that time shaker singles on the roof, 
and he was soaking down the roof because the Hawaiian village had caught fire and all of the embers were coming this way. <laughs> so here it is. <laughs> there he is out there with his hose. <laughs> During the Civil War, a man named Mabel Miranda, a Southern sympathizer, had a house in the neighborhood that was attacked by Union soldiers. And so uh, the Abel Miranda had bought this property east of us, which is now Driftwood. And <clears throat> he had a, a wonderful household over there. He had pigs and all kinds of cattle and orange trees and quite a grove and uh, just a lot of livestock and his family, and uh, he had apparently aided and abetted the escape of a Confederate uh, officer, I guess, uh, from a, a Yankee stronghold. And so he had helped him escape or helped him get away, whatever it was, I don't, can't be exact on it. And uh, so the word was out among the Yankees to get Miranda. So one night he got word from some of his friends that the Yankees had come down and commandeered a fishing smack from Fort Myers, put some cannons on her, brought her up Tampa Bay right off the middle, the front of the bayou, where it's just two blocks, three, four blocks over, and <clears throat> they anchored down with her, and they put their little uh, uh, boats overboard, and two, I think they carried two boats, and they started firing on the able. So the next day, uh, Abel Miranda and his cousin who uh, was uh, Bethel, John Bethel. Uh, and Bethel had a uh, little ranchero down in the middle of uh, Little Bio. And so he, and, and uh, they <coughs> came, they, he had sent, uh, Abe had sent his family away, you know, over quite a ways out Lakeview Avenue. And he, uh, came back up with uh, Bethel. And the, they came across our front, actually, and there were sand dunes there, and they saw that the uh, people had not yet left the farm. And there was a lot of smoke going up. They burned the house. They had butchered all the stock, took what they wanted. They had burned all of the fruit trees. There wasn't anything left. And he had to lie there on his tummy behind a, a sand dune and watch them get in back in their boats and take whatever they wanted to take, go back out to the larger boat that was out right off the mouth of the bio. And so then he and the two of them walked across here and over like so and got to where the house was, which was very close to where the Indian mound was. And so he, he packed up what was left of his world and moved out on to Lakeview further out. Helen Gandy O'Brien tells the story of her family and how they helped shape Pinellas County into what it is today. Look for more stories of pioneers and the making of Pinellas County on this centennial series. Thank you for watching.